Can you hear me now? Off. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Adam Coots. Uh, I'm a fellow of the college and co-organiser of tonight's event uh, with Doctors on Fire. Today and this week marks the seventh uh, anniversary, morbidly, of the conflict in Syria. Uh, tonight's panel consists of people who've worked on the ground in Syria, uh, medics, humanitarians and the political. Tonight's the session tonight will be run as sort of a question time panel discussion, so with audience in, in, input appreciated, uh, if you could keep your questions short and pithy rather than political statements, uh, that would be useful. I'm not saying you can't make political statements, but uh, just yeah, keep, keep questions short. Um, so tonight, so Stephen O'Brien will act as Dave Dibbleby. Um, <laughs> and I think. Well, okay, we'll get going. The first uh, discussant is Dr. David Knott, and he's going to show a uh, video and a short discussion. Oh. We were going to do that in between. I'm there at rehearsals. Okay, right, let's go. Um, not much of a question time when the, 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 the people from the table get up and give a presentation but I wasn't quite sure what I was supposed to be doing so what I thought I would do is talk to you about um, my um, life uh, very quickly in a few minutes and also to explain to you something which is really terrible um, which um, can have a dramatic effect I think on the future of uh, digitalization when it comes to helping people in war zones so I've been um, I work in these various uh, uh, um, humanitarian organisations and works all the way around the world. I uh, started off in Sarajevo in 1993, um, when there I was, a young man, um, worked in the city centre hospital uh, in Sarajevo, um, and en route to Sarajevo using uh, uh, an aeroplane, which was an ICRC aeroplane, which was also had to make a dive bomb into Sarajevo airport because there was a possibility that that airplane would be shot at uh, on the way down. This is the hospital I worked at in Sarajevo in 1993-94 called the State Hospital. This is what it's like two years ago in Sarajevo and this is what it was like when I worked in it. It was called the Swiss Cheese Hospital because there were so many holes in it. And I used to work underground in an operating theater uh, whereby a man would hold a big um, torch with car batteries with a uh, wheelbarrow if the, if the generator went off and uh, the hospital would be hit all the time and I remember being in the operating theatre uh, at one time particularly which was really imprinted in my head when the hospital was had an enormous thud when a shell went straight through the middle of the hospital we all thought the whole hospital was going to come down on top of our heads Lights went out, and um, we were there for five or 10, 20 minutes without any light at all. And our patient unfortunately died on our operating table because there was no uh, lighting to see what I was doing. Um, this is a car that I went in in Sarajevo to transport a patient up from the uh, state hospital to Kosovo hospital, which was also targeted uh, by snipers on the route. So when I was in uh, Gaza, uh, in 2014, uh, going to a hospital which was also attacked, and this is a to, to that hospital uh, where a shell had gone straight through the hospital, taken out all the people that were there, killed four people in the intensive care unit, including a nurse and a doctor who lost his arm. Um, of course, we're here to talk about Syria, and one of the most important things I'd like to talk to you about is is also ambulances. This gentleman is probably the most um, courageous man I've ever met. He used to take patients from our hospital in Aleppo and drive them up to Turkey. His ambulance was constantly shot all the time. Circling aeroplanes would watch him in the middle of the night, target him, and he lost uh, his ambulance and luckily survived. 
Now this is going in in 2014 when all the hospitals were being attacked in, in Aleppo. And this just shows a brief uh, of us arriving in Aleppo in 2014 in, in early September. I left six weeks later in, in October. <laughs> So this was an underground hospital built spe specifically because the other hospitals are being attacked all the time. Last year had full patients. Yeah, there was a. This was in. 2013, I operated in this hospital, but this is year had full patients. Yeah, there was uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight patients, and I remember having operated on quite a few of them last year. And uh, the barrel bomb hit the hospital, hit the hospital, blew out the windows, and killed how many patients? Uh, four killed. Four killed, and uh, about ten, uh, in ten injured with shrapnel and everything else. So. Um, see the devastation. Interesting to have a look at this uh, down here. You can see where the rocket came down the mosque here and totally and utterly destroyed the building. This is where we used to have our uh, breakfast. And, and this is an underground hospital with one of our patients. Now, I want to tell you a story. Uh, I think this is a really important story. When you are sitting at home wherever you are, you're still in contact with the doctors uh, in Syria. And I'm in contact with them all the time. And going back to uh, when they were under siege in Aleppo in 2016, between July and right to the end when the whole Aleppo was uh, finally uh, taken over by um, the government forces, there were doctors sitting in a hospital who were asking for help all the time. And here I am in my office, um, giving well, help very much. to them via Skype. So they're showing me a patient who had his jaw blown out, and they wanted me to help them uh, do this operation to try and uh, fix this man's jaw. They've never done it before, and these are people who I knew very, very well. I've trained them all. I've worked very hard with them, uh, both in 2013 and 2014. So I want to show you the story about this patient and also to discuss, uh, which we can do, uh, the real crisis of really what's happening. Underground and under siege, a rare glimpse into an operating theatre in Aleppo. Hollywood doesn't do the reality of war, so this is what it looks like when a man has his jaw blown off. In rebel-held Syria, being a doctor is a dangerous game. 754 doctors have been actively killed in the north uh, of Syria since the conflict started in 2011. And it's suggested that being a, a medic or even a patient in a hospital is probably the worst place you possibly can be in because hospitals are targeted constantly, doctors are targeted constantly. Mohammed, a shopkeeper, was hit, they say, by a Russian bomb which also killed two of his friends. They've never done a jaw reconstruction before, but if they don't, the chances for this father of three are slim. Oh, yes. Yes. David yes. Knott is a London surgeon who went to Aleppo two years ago to train surgeons. Now his former students have asked him to direct the jaw operation via Skype and WhatsApp. How exciting is this? For me, this is one of the most exciting things I think I've ever done. Being able to direct surgeons who I've actually trained, I've trained these boys uh, when I was there in Syria, so they know me and they have confidence in me that I know them, I have confidence in them, I know what they can do. Um, so between the two of us, um, we can do this operation. We believe this is a world first, a selfie stick being used to transport an eminent London surgeon into a basement hospital in a besieged city. I want you to take uh, an incision which goes uh, to take the whole of the pectoralis major muscle. So I want you to make an incision laterally below the, laterally below the, the, the nipple 
to, ex to start to mobilize the pectoralis major muscle, okay? Uh, Doctor, uh, actually, I, what, what about the uh, immediate movement? And uh, I make uh, two class and uh, mobilize the yeah. pectoralis major. Okay, that is absolutely fine. Uh, challenge here is that the doctors in Syria are young and enthusiastic, but they're inexperienced. They will not on the surgeon who knows what he's doing, and the two sets of doctors are connecting for the very latest in our amazing digital technology. But of course, the batteries go down, the line drops out. It's difficult, but nevertheless, the two sets of doctors are breaking the siege of Aleppo. There is a small problem here. Okay. Uh, we, we can't uh, put just loose from each uh, The doctors solved their problem, is, is, then David explained to me the complexity of the operation. This is the petroleum major muscle, Yeah. and this is the muscle which has an artery that comes off just below the collarbone there. Yeah. So we've, pres we've preserved that artery to this muscle. We've now put an area of skin on here as well, so we're going to move that right up into the man's jaw, and we're going to put it underneath the... Um, metal plate and then uh, the skin goes over the top so the skin will come here and the muscle will cover the uh, the plate. So you won't know when you look at him but he's got a plate in his mouth. Correct. You've done a wonderful job today. Thanks you yeah. How um, good has Dr. Knott been in terms of helping you do this operation? How valuable has been his help? It's a question. We are very thankful uh, or not, because it is a very difficult and complex operation. We can't do it alone. We need some help. And the patient, we, uh, because we are disabled, the patient can't go outside of Aleppo. We must do it here. This was never about just saving the life of one man. Now that the doctors in Aleppo know the technique, they can operate on other patients. But it's also about reminding them and their patients that the world has not quite forgotten Aleppo. So this was him shortly afterwards with his jaw reconstructed. But what I want to show you is something really catastrophic. So this was the hospital where we did the Skype operation. Here's me walking down the, the uh, walkway under the ground in 2014 in October. Uh, this was a hospital in 2016, they'd put some pot plants there, but there he is there. And the hospital itself, if you look at the Skype call, if you look at the architecture of the hospital, uh, when you go underground here and you look at the plan, around you, what you do is you walk down, there's lots of intensive care units around here, and you walk behind there, underground, and just there is where the operating theatre was, just directly underneath uh, that spot. I want to show you what's happened. So this is now two weeks after we did that Skype operation in M10 Hospital in Aleppo. And you can see here that this gentleman here is slightly anxious because he can hear a, some sort of jet flying around or something like that and um, looks up into the sky and is worrying that there's something about to happen. Remember, the operating theatre is just directly underneath that um, gate. So it was hit by a bunker busting bomb dropped directly onto the coordinates of that uh, operating theatre. And there you can see the bunker busting bomb there. And you can see the whole hospital is totally utterly destroyed. Now the big problem was, was that of course it makes me feel terrible. Here we are doing telemedicine, we're trying to do our very best to try and help people in other places in the world. And I've just heard uh, a week or so ago that finally the ICRC have now got the digital coordinates and worked out in fact that they got the coordinates from a digital company that they found what the coordinates that I was working in my London uh, operating uh, London room giving the call, giving the instructions to the Aleppo surgeons in their hospital and they found those coordinates as well and so what they're doing in the months or so's time now we're having a big discussion on 
looking at those coordinates and who picked those coordinates up. It doesn't bear much thinking about. It. Now the problem is, of course, that puts us in a very difficult situation. We cannot help anybody anymore in Syria. We can't do it by telemedicine. Obviously, my phone's hacked. My te my computer's hacked. People know what's going on. So it has a significant knock-on effect uh, to help people uh, remotely. And that's a very big problem. Um, we obviously do a lot and um, try and make advocacy for all this, but it's a big, big problem. Thank you. Well, David, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'm going to sort of now coordinate things before we get to the question time. I'm Stephen O'Brien. I've recently been the Under Secretary General at the United Nations for Humanitarian Affairs and the Emergency Relief Coordinator, and previously a Minister at DFID. Um, but we'll come on to uh, making sure that we cover all the ground that's uh, on your mind. But that was an extremely powerful and, and moving presentation, David, to very much set the scene of uh, the outstanding courage and bravery and commitment people have to the saving of life and the protecting of civilians who are caught up in these long protracted unresolved terrible conflicts where uh, as we will now come on to there is an absence of the context by which you can have the confidence that your great work can uh, sustain uh, because of the often the legal and the political uh, and the um, uh, and the sheer brazen uh, uh, determination to win fights at the expense of everybody. So I'm going to uh, assume that you've all read the extensive biographies that were in the literature before you came, otherwise we'd take up far, much, far, much, far too much time reading out everybody's uh, illustrious history. Um, but uh, having gone from a, a doctor in action, we're now going to go to a, a lawyer in action, if I can put it that way, uh, to Tony Camp, make his contribution, and then we'll uh, move along the table. Tony. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, so yes, I'm I'm the lawyer on the uh, on the panel of um, the with the other three uh, incredible individuals. Um, so I'm I'm very proud to be a part of uh, Doctors Under Fire. Um, I also uh, run uh, a barrister's chambers that specialises exclusively in international work, um, and I've been working on Syrian cases since uh, very early on in the revolution. Um, I first became involved in uh, June 2011, um, and my first interaction was actually with a Syrian doctor. Um, I hadn't made a conscious decision to get involved in Syrian work. Um, my work up until that point, I'd spent a number of years in Bosnia uh, prosecuting war crimes. Um, I had promised myself when I returned to England in 2009 that I would never work on another war crimes case again. Um, I was then uh, sort of thrust into Syrian work. Um, and I met a, a doctor in Phila Philadelphia um, whose, whose brother was, uh, was executed by the Syrian regime in the circumstances that I can explain. And that, that really showed me the, the, the level, even at that early stage of the conflict, um, how, how, how appalling um, the attacks on medical facilities, doctors, um, people that were doing great work um, assisting on, on casualties on all sides, uh, not just treating those that were fighting for the revolution, but treating those on all sides. Um, so I came across an individual by the name of Dr. Halam, Haz oh, Halam Hazak, who is uh, a US citizen originally from Syria. Um, his brother was a Syrian doctor. Uh, he came to visit him in the United States to attend a, a pharmaceutical symposium in, in Florida. Um, had no involvement in the revolution, had no involvement in politics. He was a doctor. He returned to Syria after six weeks in the United States, and he agreed with a number of doctor colleagues to sign a petition to say that they would dedicate their time, whatever time they could, to treating uh, civilian casualties. As a result of signing that letter, he was arrested um, in, in Damascus, uh, and he disappeared. We were able to identify what happened to him. Um, we, we were able to find his car. His handprints were on the, uh, on the boot of the car, which showed that he had been taken out and interrogated. And his tortured body and bullet-ridden body was found about 25 miles outside of Damascus. 
He was killed for wanting to help civilians who were caught up in the conflict. And for me, that, that really demonstrated uh, the need to get involved. And so since that time, I've worked with a number of groups with uh, Doctors Under Fire. I've also worked with a group called Lawyers and Doctors for Human Rights, a, a Syrian group that documents uh, cases primarily of torture um, in Syria and working with them to make sure that the, the very important work that they're doing inside Syria, which is, which is effectively taking statements and helping people to get over the trauma of torture, but that that doesn't go to waste, that that is documented in a way that can one day be used in a criminal trial. The second case of a doctor uh, that I've, I've been involved with for, for some time uh, involves the uh, arrest torture and execution of a British national, uh, a doctor by the name of Dr. Abbas Khan, who traveled to Aleppo uh, to volunteer his time uh, to, to work with Syrian doctors. And he was arrested almost immediately upon arriving in Aleppo. Um, he was held in a number of different facilities. He was tortured. His family was told that he was due to be released. And on the day that he was due to be released, he was found um, hanging in his cell. His case is, is very important because he is the only casualty of the conflict, uh, the only death where the body has actually been returned to the family. And that's quite significant. And it actually resulted in his matter being in front of a, a coroner's court, which returned a, a verdict of unlawful killing in custody. That case, we, we are doing our utmost to ensure that what happened to him at all stages in, in the three or four different facilities that he was held in is properly documented so that it actually can be prosecuted before a British court. Um, and coincidentally, I actually had a meeting with the Metropolitan Police on, on Monday to discuss how we can take his case forward. The question is often asked, why are we prosecuting a case like that before uh, a British court? Why are we not taking it to the International Criminal Court? And I think it's important to, to explain that. I'm sure many of you in the room will know why. But it's a question which is frequently asked by the Syrians. Why is this not significant enough? Why can we not go to the International Criminal Court? Well, the International Criminal Court being the first permanent court of its kind following a number of ad hoc tribunals in the 90s that were established, has very limited jurisdiction. It can only look at matters of uh, situations in countries that have agreed to be bound by the International Criminal Court by ratifying the Rome Statute, those countries that self-refer themselves to the International Criminal Court, and those <coughs> situations that are of such gravity that the UN Security Council refers it to the International Criminal Court, such as the situation in Libya. Now, the difficulty that we have is that at least one of the five permanent members of the Security Council has a vested interest in this never going before the International Criminal Court, namely Russia, and has consistently vetoed, along with the support of China, any potential referral to the Inter International Criminal Court. And we're at a stage now, and the question being asked is, is IHL dead? Well, it's not dead, but it is ineffective because of the lack of accountability. Because of the Security Council being uh, impotent in dealing with a matter of this kind when one of the five permanent members has the ability to prevent any investigation into their own conduct. And, that, and that's the reality. The, the involvement of Russia, particularly in targeting the hospitals, is well documented. And so they will continuously prevent it from going before the International Criminal Court. What we have been left with is going through the UN General Assembly that, that has no power of veto. And what we've recently seen is effectively the best that we can do, which is setting up uh, a mechanism, a UN mechanism that will serve as a body that can take evidence, that can formulate cases, <coughs> but it has no judicial character. It doesn't have the ability to set up an international ad hoc tribunal or to refer the situation to, to the International Criminal Court. 
So the question is, what's actually going to happen with all of those cases? And the reality is that many of these cases, if they're ever going to be prosecuted, are going to be prosecuted in one of three ways. One, before national courts under universal jurisdiction, which is the basis upon which we now, our group, Guernica, has one case before the Spanish National Court. And we have, of course, the possibility of Dr. Alice Khan's case being prosecuted before a British court. The second alternative is that the, <coughs> the evidence and the material is documented and retained for future prosecution for a future international criminal court. And a lot of, fo of the focus is on, on that in particular, that there will be a time when <coughs> these individuals will be prosecuted. We only, only have to look at the examples of Charles Taylor, Rekha Mladic, Slobodan Milosevic, who obviously uh, died through this trial, but we never actually thought we'd get to the stage where these individuals could be prosecuted, and they were. And then the third area uh, that, that we spend a lot of time working on is that when you look at a conflict of this kind, and I can draw a comparison with the work in Bosnia. When I started at the prosecutor's office in Bosnia, we had 10,000 cases to deal with, which was simply impossible. We were never going to be able to deal with that many cases. Plus, we had to deal with the overflow from the Yugoslav Tribunal in the Hague. But you have to recognize that the vast majority of this work will be done by national actors, by, by national institutions, <coughs> by Syrians. But they can only do that with our support. We have to provide them with the resources, the skills in which to build up institutions, because there will come a day, we all have to hope, where Syria is a democracy, where there are democratic institutions, and these institutions will have to take on a large share of this. Now, I appreciate, and I can see some of the uh, looks in the room already, uh, of the utmost cynicism, um, which I share. But we have to work on that basis that uh, the vast majority of this work is, is going to have to be taken by Syrian institutions at some stage. And that is certainly one of the points that I've made to the UN mechanism that they really need to focus on. They need to work much closer with Syrian institutions, with Syrian civil society groups that have a huge contribution to this. Because the one thing, and one of the questions that I was asked before I started speaking by Saleh was, you know, we learn from uh, past experiences. Well, we don't. We make the same mistakes time and time again. We don't build up national capacity that we'll have to deal with th these types of matters. And that's very, very important. We, we have to focus on that. But we are faced with a situation when we look at half the Syrian population is either displaced, dead, disappeared, or in detention. And, and the final point, I know I said I'd only be five minutes, but I did say that I'd probably uh, extend that. The, one of the areas that our group has focused on is the detention <coughs> facilities, the underground prisons, where there are tens of thousands of individuals who are still missing. And I had the uh, fortune of meeting an individual who has become known as Caesar several years ago, when he first defected. And when you look at the material that he has documented, what he was forced to do on a daily basis, uh, documenting thousands of individuals who had been starved and tortured to death. The detention facilities is a particular focus and must be a particular focus because there are estimates of at least 100,000 individuals who are still in those prisons. The international community has no access to those prisons. Whatever support that there was through the previous commission of inquiry, has long since passed. There is no ability to get in there and actually investigate these. And this is going to be a major stumbling block for, for the UN mechanism. They're not going to be able to get into the country to investigate. And so again, I come back to the point that it's re relying on Syrian groups who have the ability to investigate in country, which is going to be the most important. So there is a great deal of pessimism whenever we talk about these things. But I see a lot of very, very good work being done. I see the work being done by the, 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 the others on, on the panel. And I work very, very closely with Syrian groups 
that are putting their lives at risk to make sure that the history, that the documentation is not lost, and that's very, very important. And we have to hope and we have to push that one day these individuals will be held accountable, whether that's in court in London, in Madrid, or The Hague. That will happen one day, as history has shown us, that that is the most important. And so IHL is not dead. It is very much alive. But at the moment, it's just a series of documents that are not being ad adhered to. What we have to do in order to, to reinforce the importance of those rules is to ensure that there is a level of accountability, because it's only through accountability that it will ever have any meaning. Because Assad can sit in comfort in his palace in Damascus, knowing that nothing will, will happen. And he can continue to do this. And then the, the, the rules that we refer to will be truly dead. And so it's the accountability that we have to focus on. Thank you. Tony, thank you very much indeed. There's no question there'll be many aspects of what you've raised uh, we come back to. And uh, I can certainly testify to my many times before the Security Council how real those real conundrums are in terms of trying to put uh, relevant states on notice that the evidence is being held, is being collected, and will one day come back to be used in evidence. Uh, and that is in itself uh, one of the keys to accountability going forward. So we look forward to discussing that. Thank you very much indeed. I now turn to uh, Hamish to Bretton Gordon, who I'm sure many of you will recognize from his many appearances on the radio over recent times. Um, a very experienced uh, officer in the army with a great expertise in uh, the uh, chemical biological uh, side of uh, weaponry and has put all that knowledge to enormous great public and uh, public good and benefits by uh, focusing on the humanitarian applications of his uh, directorship of, of Doctors Under Fire. So Hamish. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Yes, I was a soldier uh, for 23 years but I like to think for the last six years I've been a humanitarian so I like to see myself as sort of muscularly humanitarian uh, these days. I'd just like to, for you to hold two thoughts. My, I was always in the army, I was told I had the loudest voice in NATO, so probably, <laughs> probably, probably don't need this thing. Just, just have two thoughts, red lines and intervention. I think uh, two of the greatest crimes against humanity are the direct targeting of hospitals, medical personnel, and also the use of chemical weapons, the 100-year taboo uh, since the First World War has been well and truly uh, broken uh, by the use of chemical weapons. Um, and when it comes to intervention, uh, in, in my time in the military, I was part of every intervention, whether that's good or bad or not, but I, I did both Gulf Wars, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, several tours in Iraq and several tours in Afghanistan. So I have a personal experience. In the last six years, I've been in and out of Syria. Um, the only point I'll leave at this stage is that uh, my experiences in Syria have been far worse than my experiences in those countries where we did actually uh, intervene. Um, just looking at chemical weapons at the moment, uh, very apposite with what's happening in Salisbury at the moment. Today is also the 30th anniversary of the Halabja massacre where 5,000 people were killed in under one hour in a nerve agent attack um, on Halabja. Um, three of us on the panel are, are ex-military and I'm sure they'll back me up, I'm sure as doctors as well. Uh, the morale of a soldier going into battle is very much dependent on the medical facilities that is available to him or her. And certainly all the operations I did, particularly in Afghanistan, one never went into them unless you were pretty certain that there was, a, if you were shot or badly injured, there, there would be somebody like David or Saleh to stitch us up and put us back together. That morale aspect to it is very compelling. When we look at Syria uh, and our time in Syria, um, it is interesting, it's not interesting, it's shocking to see how Assad and the Russians are using that by directly targeting hospitals and medics in Syria. Uh, not only is the red lines broken, but it's breaking the will of people to resist. Um, we were all involved in getting children out of Aleppo in December 16, which was one small success in a devastating 
uh, conflict there. One of the horrific things that I found, um, which personified the red lines over use of chemical weapons, on 17 of the last 21 days of the siege of Aleppo in December 16, the regime dropped chlorine barrel bombs on East Aleppo. The heavier than air gas went underground into the cellars where children and women were hiding. It forced them above ground, whether they were then shot at by snipers or conventional weapons, and eventually led to, in effect, their surrender and their ethnic cleansing to Idlib province. This is exactly the same is happening in, in Ghouta today. In fact, had it not been for the Salisbury nerve agent attack two weeks ago, you might have heard of the three major chlorine barrel bomb attacks in Ghouta over the last seven days, which again have only killed a few people directly, but have forced them above ground. And uh, the Union of Syrian Medical Charities, uh, which all of us support, uh, run eight hospitals in Ghouta. Uh, they've all been destroyed in the last few weeks and months. And when it comes on to medical facilities, again, having been on the battlefields of the world as a soldier for 23 years and the last six years as a humanitarian, the rules of war dictate that opponent adversaries hand over detailed locations of medical facilities so that they can be avoided and protected and a red line is put around them. In the Syrian conflict, one that we haven't intervened in, this information has been used as targeting data to do something in the military we call dynamic targeting. You feed eight or ten figure grid references into a targeting computer that then gets transcribed to an aircraft and a spotter on the ground so that you can drop a precision guided weapon onto a square about a metre square. And as you saw with David's video of M10, that is exactly uh, what has happened. And doctors under fire, what, what is our role? Uh, we, we're, are we an NGO? We're a lobbying group. I think crucially what we're trying to do is to lobby world leaders to start to reimpose red lines and get rid of taboos. I feel, as a chemical counterterrorism expert, that we are somewhat responsible, we the Brits, for what has happened in Salisbury. When Assad dropped sarin on Ghouta on the 21st of August 2013 and killed 1,500 people, we did nothing about it, we didn't intervene. Since then, there have been over 1,000 recorded uses of chemical weapons in Syria. And I myself have been gassed with the Peshmerga in Mosul only 10 months ago. That was, I accept, by the Islamic State. But we have sort of brought it on ourselves and. You know, whatever happens in the Salisbury incident, I think a lot of it might be that um, whoever, well, when the Russians decided to use nerve agent in, in, in Salisbury, they didn't expect us to do anything about it because we haven't hitherto. And directly when it comes to hospitals, this uh, disappearance of these red lines around hospitals and medics, that hitherto had held, and it's not only Syria, there's still other places, is something that we really must impose. And when I hear non-interventionists and people tell me how dreadful the intervention in Iraq was and elsewhere, I do try and say that having been in all of those wars and all of those places, uh, being somewhere like Aleppo uh, or Ghouta is 10 times worse and more horrific than anything I ever saw in Afghanistan and Iraq. I think we must be open-minded and flexible because as we go forward we must reimpose those red lines in protecting hospitals and medics or there is very little hope for humanity in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed Hamish. Uh, again very powerful and certainly I think all of us who've had the in a sense the uh, the opportunity, but also the, the horror of seeing these bombed out of places which have been subjected to such terrible, uh, direct, deliberate uh, crimes against humanity, it, uh, it really does make you realize that the reality on the ground and the divorce from the, the big institutional architecture, which Toby was referring to, which David has been working with ever since started, is, is where I can see so much of the testimony is being to tie to. I'm very much looking forward to our discussion because this will be 
how do we get the reality of the ground to be held to account so that we can start making a difference in the future? And um, to that end, I want to make sure that we also hear the voice from within Syria. So uh, we have uh, Fadi al Diari uh, with us, who's the country director of Hand in Hand for Aid and Development. We're very grateful he's got a moment to be able to uh, give a, a bit of back, more background and context for us. And um, operating very much uh, in the UK and Turkey and Jordan, but for, as I understand it, uniquely the, the needs of Syrians in Syria. So uh, to to Fadi, who has a, uh, a presentation which I think, uh, as Adam comes down the stairs, it gives me an opportunity to thank Adam Coots and the Department of Sociology for arranging all this. So thank you very much, Adam. Those who know Adam, he did the last day. They claim to doing great work, so well done. Um, and, uh, and, and so hopefully we'll have Fanny's presentation that we can then look at, and then we'll conclude the presentations uh, with uh, Soleya, and then we'll open it up to the, to the floor. So Fanny, over to you. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I mean, it's good to see you. I mean, it's, good. it's an interesting discussion. Probably I'm the only one who's uh, having some serious origin behind. Uh, it's, I think it's quite flattering, I mean, standing here, because you have no rules to see here, but I mean, the way you spoke made me feel like we're doing nothing compared to what you're doing, guys. So thank you again. Uh, if I may play the video now, and then we can talk. أنا كنت أبص في المنظمات الحدودية بمشفى باب الهواء وبيت لي قبل ما يتفاعل المشفى بفهم بين الجماعات وبعد ما تفاعل المشفى نحن صرنا نحصل هون والمشفى هون كان على ختم قسم كبير من المرضى أنا اليوم كان دور بالغسيل جيت لهون تفاجأت من المشفى مدمر بشكل كامل وقسم الغسيل مضطر ضار كبير ف. راح نعاني كثير نحن من الموضوع هذا واللي زادت علينا المعاناة انه كل الاقسام اللي هي كانوا ده الغسيل في المنطقة الحدودية راح نعاني كثير من الموضوع نتمنى من منظمات الدعمية والرجاء فعل القسم الغسيل بمشفى الفرمبيل الجراحي لأنه بمعظم الأقسام أو بالأحرى كل الأقسام اللي بالمنطقة أخذت عن الخدمة security group so we follow the safety of our team and I got the message where the hospital is being bombed I thought 
or what's, what's happened. The next thing is like there is no response from the field. And so we think, okay, we wait for a few more minutes. We need, we need to get a response. That's, I mean, somebody somewhere must have an answer for us. And then like six minutes later, the, the response was, we are okay, but a second bomb has landed. So it's six minutes later. And then we thought, okay, so every, is everyone okay? They said, yeah, so far we are, we are still okay. Now, luckily, I would say, the, uh, now previously this hospital on the 25th of March, it was previously attacked from the air. Uh, and since then we decided like, okay, I'm gonna come clean. I'm gonna share the coordinates with the Russians, with the American, with the British. So we kind of like, I contacted the Russian embassy here in London. I said, look, I mean, these are our coordinates and these are purely humanitarian facilities. They ignored me, the Russian embassy here. Thought, okay, I can, I can escalate it. So we went through UN OCHA and UN OCHA kindly uh, contacted the Russian Center for Reconciliation, which is in Latakia. And they acknowledged receipt of the coordinates and they thought, okay, it's on the exclusion list. Now, I was like so confident in my office thinking, no, we won't be hit again because we share the coordinates. And then when it happened, I thought there must be something wrong. So straight away I was on the phone. No, actually, somebody from UN Ocha contacted me saying, your hospital has been hit. So immediately, the minute I knew about it, the UN were on the phone to say, you've been hit. It's like, yes, I'm hit. So they kind of like, it took like 40 minutes, sorry, 41 minutes between the first attack and the final attack before we got, yes, all four bombs landed on the hospital and they took it out of service. Uh, I think the first bomb, it hit the fence, sorry, yeah, the fence outside. So it gave us like six minutes to evacuate from the above ground into the underground. The underground facility was dug entirely from scratch in the mountain. So it's an area of 1,800 square meter at a cost about just under half a million dollar. Uh, and before we managed to finish it, the hospital above the ground was destroyed. But luckily now, we moved to the underground facility. Now by, I know I was only allowed five minutes, so I'm nearly my time. The hospital, as you saw in the figure, is served 83,845. Uh, out of this, ICU 668. Uh, internal medicine unit, for example, 5,257. Uh, emergency room has served 15, sorry, 15,588. So these are some of the figures we have. And thanks for, uh, I know Stephen look at me. Uh, I think I will sum it up. Uh, thank you again for listening. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. And, uh, uh, I will remember the, the connection between you and Ocha and, and yourselves and uh, uh, rather, as, um, as was mentioned by Toby before, there's a terrible feeling of information which is shared for good purposes. Uh, you, you then aren't quite sure whether you've actually been part of the problem rather than the solution. It's a, a terrible quandary for those of us who are motivated to, to be in the life-saving um, uh, accountability. So there we are. Um, thank you very much indeed for that. And so finally, by no means least, uh, Salah, uh, you're going to be able to uh, uh, try and pull a lot of this together and, uh, and how, we, how we try to be more impactful going forward to be able to serve people whose needs are just beyond, beyond belief. Okay. So um, Hamish has already spoken about um, who we are and, and why we came about. Oh, there we go. And um, yes, Dr. Thunder Fine. Um, I am an emergency medicine doctor. Uh, I came to medicine late. Before medicine, I was in the army. Um, I, had, like many medics, I had followed the career of and, and the work of David and had admired him uh, and, and what he had been doing uh, in previous conflicts. Uh, he's a little bit of a legend and uh, I, when I left the army I started to work in conflict zones. There was another surgeon who inspired me as well, uh, Mrs Pauline Cutting, who was up with her work in, uh, in, in Lebanon during the 80s. When I first met David, um, he'd been involved in the work in, in helping victims in Haiti. Um, we, dis we discovered that we overlapped on people we knew on the work we did. Um, 
we often ended up in the same country but in different areas. In Libya, I was in Tripoli, Bani Walid, and David was working in Misrata. But it was through Syria, what was going on in Syria, that we actually joined together and, and, and really thought, this is off the scale. This is bigger than anything else that we've encountered. What are we going to do about it? And I think just the anger as doctors, as healthcare workers, as humanitarians, against the way that our patients, our staff, our colleagues, our facilities in Syria have been so discriminately targeted with so little disrespect for the instruments and the mechanisms that are in place to protect us. We came together as a group and we just thought, well, what can we do? What, what is out there already doesn't seem to be doing it. So maybe we come together, we get, we can vent together, um, we can maybe act and, and, and try something new. And that's how Doctors Under Fire came, to, came about. David was connected with Toby and with Hamish, and I think two years ago now, uh, every year it's shocking that it's still Syria. So I think it was two years ago, David said, let's gather, let's call ourselves Doctors Under Fire, and let's have a march. Let's voice our anger, let's write the Prime Minister. Yes, we did all that, and it was extremely powerful, but we're still here. Um, that's how Dr. Thunder Fire came about, and it's just giving us uh, uh, an identity to, to maybe join the push forward to push for change. Me, personally, um, I was uh, an army officer. I went to Sandhurst and then joined the uh, Royal Army Medical Corps as a non-medic. I was a medical support officer. I served in Bosnia in the 1990s. All my soldiers were combat medic technicians. As a non-combatant myself, because I was within the Royal Army Medical Corps, I wore the emblem when I was on ops, on, op on operations, so did my soldiers. I spent the majority of my time driving around in a Land, land Rover, very clearly marked with a red cross on the side of it. And I felt safe and I felt protected because of who we were. We didn't feel the need to hide that emblem or who we belonged to or who, who we worked for. Now, fast forward to now, I would never do that. I would put my stethoscope at the bottom of my bag and I would pretend to be something else. I wouldn't openly declare that I'm a medic when I go into Syria. Doctors are considered the most dangerous people on the ground in Syria to those that want to do uh, to Syria to the Russians and the Syrian regime, I'm just gonna say it. Um, as Hamish was saying, medics in conflict and the work that they do is just so powerful and so important for the morale of the people that you're working for. They've got safety and security and the knowledge that if something happens, there is a team that is protected uh, to be able to look after them. They do not have to worry about being taken to a hospital that might be bombed. In Syria in 2013 when I was there, um, none of the team, none of the staff undressed at night to go to change their clothes or whatever when they went to sleep because everyone slept in the hospital. I asked the team, you know, gosh, does anyone ever like have some downtime? And the girls never took their headscarves off. And the reason being, you just don't know when a barrel bomb is going to come out of the sky and you're going to have to run out. That's the change. I've worked in Palestine, I've worked in Libya, and I've, I've worked in Syria. And every step, Syria, as I say, in comparison to those places, off the scale. I went off to, so after Libya, I decided that I want to learn about the, the mechanisms officially. So I went off and did an LLM in International Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at Essex. And I was really impressed with what I learned about the evolution of international humanitarian law, how it came about, how the pioneer Henry Dunant in the 1860, 1964 came up with the concept that uh, uh, there should be some way of protecting uh, those parties to the conflict. Um, uh, and then there, uh, yeah, the Geneva Conventions came about. I mean, it came about because of the most, you know, uh, it, it was born because of horrific war conditions to protect the soldiers on the ground, to make sure that they could have access to healthcare. 
And then it evolved over years and subsequent wars to protect civilians as well. Then we had the League of Nations in the 1990s come about because of the horrors of the First World War. This then evolved to the United Nations. My argument is now, Syria stands alone. What is going to happen in the next stage of the evolution of international humanitarian law and the mecha mechanisms and the entities? I think now, I feel so strongly that now is one of those pivotal times because what we have right now is impotent. It's not working. Syria, um, at, at the UN Security Council, their action is constantly vetoed by Russia. We know this. And even before all the things that have been going on in Salisbury, I was, when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, I really wanted to talk about action against Russia. If we're serious as uh, other member states, if we are serious as, uh, as other countries in our anger, and shock at what is going on in Syria, we need to then take action in other ways. I was thinking about sanctions, I was thinking about the, the World Cup, football, uh, you know, football, all those things. If you're serious, let's act. Anyway, something else has come along. Um, but I think it's important, I think it's really important to turn those, that, that there are acts happening at uh, diplomatic levels, that are failing, the UN Security Council hasn't been able to bring, yet. there was, when I came back from Syria in 2013, myself and David went to the Foreign Office, we talked about, we, we, we arrived just soon after um, the first, I think it was one of the first UN resolutions on humanitarian aid, that uh, trying to get in to Syria uh, to, to provide humanitarian aid. And I just thought, you know, what world are we living in? where it has taken nearly a year just to come to a, a decision that allows humanitarian aid in. I didn't like the world that we were living in. I really feel that it's up to us now to do something. I don't know when the, maybe the discussions are already happening. I don't know, I'm not on that pay scale. I am just a humble Amy doctor working in London. But, I hope the people out there that are, are in positions of power or, uh, or within that sphere thinking about where we go next because what we have right now isn't working and I feel that we are at that point in time where we've got to evolve to the next level. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sidney, and I think that tees us up very, very well for a lot of the issues which I dare say are on, on your minds, and I'm very keen that we should get a real sense of the various points and questions which you now have in the audience. Bear in mind that the uh, event is, is described as attacking health, the end of humanitarian law, question uh, mark. I think that Toby made a, a defence that it exists. I certainly say from my own experience, and perhaps I'll get an opportunity towards the end just to give a little bit of a, um, a, a summary of, of my experience of, of being the humanitarian at the Security Council in the UN higher uh, cabinet and, and what it means to have that dis, disjunction between all the structures that are meant to be in place and the actuality of what it takes place in maintaining uh, momentum for action. But the context is, and I think it's a very important point that you raised, uh, Celia, is that international humanitarian law, and uh, Toby will be the expert who's able to describe this, uh, has been around since the 1860s and has developed, of course, through experience. Of course, it didn't in itself stop two world wars and, and all the terrible horrors. Uh, its custodianship in Geneva, and very much uh, under the leadership of the International Committee of the Red Cross, these are not part of the UN, which in itself was a successor to the League of Nations and the lessons that were learned from how that didn't operate well. Uh, and the, the one thing I found very important to use as the Under Secretary General uh, in my presentations, which uh, I have to confess were regarded as somewhat forthright at the Security Council, uh, particularly on the issue about uh, East Aleppo, uh, when we'd had the terrible bombing of the UN convoy uh, south of Aleppo uh, and saying that we needed to have accountability, is international humanitarian law as against the Charter of the United Nations, unamended for 72 years. So it stood the test of time, does well, but it is to do with the regulation of states. And the sanctions only impinge upon human beings when you have this marginal crossover to the international criminal 
You've got the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a magnificent document, which is again still the test of time. We've now got Agenda 2030. I'm particularly fond of uh, SDG 16, Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions. And from the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul in May 16, we ended up with our five uh, core uh, commitments for the Agenda for Humanitarian, uh, for humanitarian Action. And of course, number one is prevent and end conflicts. Two is respect the rules of war. Three is leave no one behind. Four, work differently to end need, i.e. across everybody, and invest rather than simply grant fund humanity. And uh, the one thing that uh, I'm clear about, which was shocking to me at the times I had as the, uh, as the humanitarian chief, was that just five years ago, certainly 10 years ago, about 20% of what we, the humanitarians of the world, were dealing with in responding to human, human beings in crisis was caused man-made by conflict. And there were many protracted crises, you only have to think of Dadaab camp in northeast Kenya from the Somalia crisis, where two generations have now been born in the camp and have no prospect of going home. Today, it's 96% of humanitarian need of the 143 million people who need us tonight for their lives to be saved or to be protected as civilians who are not part of the conflict, whether it's because of states uh, such as we've been hearing, or indeed those who are the insurrectionists, the groups which are not to do with states that live behind borders. And of that 143 million who need us, uh, we need about $23 million and then mobilize somewhere between half and two million people who are in their various ways humanitarians in all the sectors to bring to bear, including, I would add, certainly add the military, uh, who are brilliant at being able to bring assets and disciplines to bear upon so many emergency responses, but it's more and more difficult when 96% is out of man-made conflict, to which I make the argument, therefore surely is capable of being unmade by man, which I think is your primary argument of the institutions that we have are challenging. So I think those are, that's the context of the law. The international humanitarian law does apply to every individual. It isn't just a bind on states. And I think that's where the question we have in front of us today is vital for us to understand. And I don't want to get too heavily. I was actually taught law here at Cambridge, but only practiced for five years as a lawyer, which I think says a lot about my quality as a lawyer. But uh, certainly the international legal side is very difficult because of this question about enforceability and accountability and how do you get it to work so that people feel concerned about it rather than simply nodding and moving on and then still wanting to win their fight. So uh, can you perhaps indicate with a show of hands how many questions we've got in the room so I can sort of try and gauge uh, the amount of time so we can have a good interaction. So one, two, three, four, five, We've got a good half dozen in the room, so um, what we'll do is we'll take um, perhaps a, a group of three questions. I won't necessarily get everybody to answer every question, but pass them out, and then we'll have a chance at the end just to make some very brief summaries, and I think that makes sure that we get uh, some things going. So, um, have you all got very loud voices? It'll save the time of somebody roaming around with the microphone. Well, by the way, we're being live streamed, aren't we, uh, Adam? So, do you need the microphone to be on their voices, or will they pick it up? There's one down here. So if somebody could be super speedy about getting microphones to people so we don't waste time uh, trying to get people to win the microphone. Who's going to go first? Right, why don't you go first, but we get that microphone to you. And then um, there was a lady, the lady further up, was there? Or the, yes, the lady there. Um, perhaps Adam, you could get the microphone into her hand to be ready. Uh, can you give your name and any organization or concern you represent before you make your question? Sure, um, my name is James Denzel. I work for Save the Children. Um, this issue of adapting healthcare into conflict scenarios, I was one, I'm wondering whether we could unpack a little bit more. I mean, Hamish made the point about being a muscular humanitarian. We've gone, to, gone from a world in which uh, aid and uh, health structures were protected spaces, now they're being targeted. And we did some research that showed a 100% increase in the numbers of attacks on schools and hospitals over the last decade. So we've gone from that world to that world. Uh, you mentioned already uh, the, the notion of um, seeing uh, Skype being used as a targeting device. I'm just wondering, um, could you, I mean, we had a hospital that we supported in eastern Aleppo that put out a press release saying it had been destroyed uh, to hope to stop being targeted. It was still operational. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any ideas around how to better protect healthcare in conflict. Is it about having less big hospitals, smaller clinics, uh, more diffuse clinics, unmarked ambulances, and, on, and anonymity for healthcare staff, encrypted communications around telemedicine, tight control over location sharing so you don't get media coverage that could potentially allow people to try and geolocate where things are. I'm just wondering how much thinking is going on on that. 
Very good question. David, can you pump that for a minute and yeah. then um, we'll come back to that. So, lady up there. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Saria. I'm a PhD student at Cambridge University. Just started, uh, I'm focusing on public health and aging research. Uh, I come originally from Lebanon, so I'm uh, uh, a neighbor of uh, what's happening in Syria. And I've been witnessing all this, uh, unfortunately, and all the trouble that people are facing inside Syria and for the refugees who are living uh, in Lebanon. Uh, I worked closely uh, with Syrian refugees in one of my projects when I was uh, doing my master's at the American University of Beirut. And uh, I was placed in one of the uh, non-governmental organizations who was working with Syrian refugees in Lebanon. And I, I was interested in the idea of humanitarian aid that you mentioned, and how we can get that into uh, Syria, inside the country where the conflict is still ongoing. And I was interested about how uh, doctors under fire are, co are maybe collaborating with other NGOs that are present there, like MSF and MDM and other agencies. Uh, and how could the availability or the presence of these organizations that were already there since the very beginning or even before the conflict can help um, um, like can help doctors under fire or other uh, humanitarian aid agencies to go inside or provide some of the care that is needed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And then a question here. My name is Miriam Orkut. Um, I work with the UCL Lancet Commission on Migration and Health and also with the Syrian Public Health Network and my background is medical. Um, I had a question about the red lines um, and I was just wondering in terms of the situation currently in Eastern Ghouta um, and the past situation in Aleppo and the potential situation in Idlib that's being predicted, whether there, what action can be taken now and what kind of accountability mechanisms are possible currently in order to actually provide, well, protect civilians, provide access for humanitarian aid or humanitarian aid corridors, um, evacuate unwell patients, because I mean, I think, I think, I, first of all, thank you all so much because I think the work you're doing is extremely valuable, um, but I just wonder what the discussions are um, from individual doctor um, level and also policy level about immediate action. Excellent. So let's just uh, have a little bit of a reaction to those topics. David, do you want to just make sure you can tackle uh, Jamie's question about what effectively has been culminated in the campaign of not a target, which is when a lot of us have come together to try and suggest we're not a target. But I would also add, very importantly, it's not just the static hospitals, it's the routes to many yeah. care, uh, whether it's ambulances or even walking routes between communities and whether we need more outreach. Well, it's, it's, of course, it's well known that International Humanitarian Law and Geneva Conventions are there to help civilians, ambulances, all healthcare workers, hospitals, that you name it. And when I was working in Gaza in 2014 during the war, the Re ICRC hospital had the biggest red cross on the service, I'm, I'm sure you know, on the roof of the hospital, just, and the floodlights were on top of it, we were underneath it, and we were told that, you know, this hospital will not be targeted. And it wasn't, in fact, during that. Everybody did comply, both the Palestinians, the Gazans, and the <coughs> Israelis, that it wasn't uh, harmed at all. Other facilities were, um, but certainly the ICRC hospital were. When I was wor working in Syria in 2013 and 14, uh, we worked in small hospitals which were uh, given code names um, and also nobody wanted to know we didn't want anybody to know who where the hospitals were and not only that all of us the doctors there were also given code names as well and different names which we changed every few weeks or so so we we're quite aware that you know it's important that people did not know where we were so we've got one side where everybody says okay we should know where we were and it was successful the other side was we don't want anybody to know and there's that difference between those one end of the spectrum, the other end of the spectrum. What you said about all those technologies and things which you very uh, rightly talked about are things that need to be discussed and things that need to be formulated in the future. But I think at the moment, you know, the most important thing is, is that people should understand that hospitals shouldn't be targeted, no matter if they're big or small or anything. I was, I was actually in the Russian embassy um, two, three weeks ago, pushing this point forward banging the drum, saying, you know, we, you must, Mr. Consul, you must not target hospitals. Well, David, he said, the problem is, is that there are terrorists within these hospitals, and therefore they're a legitimate target. So how then do you then say, well, actually, there's no terrorists in the hospitals. 
yes, there are. And of course, I don't 100% know whether there are people there or not, but still, uh, it's a big issue. Thank you. And it's very much repeated what uh, MSF found when their hospital at Kunduz in Afghanistan uh, was attacked. Was they used the excuse that they were chasing terrorists in the hospital. But of course, once somebody needs medical attention, uh, nobody is either is anything they need medical attention. That's the priority. Uh, I think the other thing is when I was at point zero at uh, Bab al Hawa on the cross between Turkey into Syria, as a result of that hard won year long resolution, which was unique. Of cross-border supplies, which, however awful it was to get, it uh, it was fantastic to get, and it was a, a pioneering thing, and over very many uh, political uh, difficulties. Uh, but it was very clear that a lot of the lorry drivers, who were just private lorry driver citizens, were being put under intense pressure to say precisely where they were driving supplies, often to supply hospitals, which was another form of getting the coordinates, which you have picked up off your computer. So it's actually looking after the, the supply chain and protecting them is as important as those who are delivering medical. Uh, expertise. Um, perhaps both Toby and Hamish could address the uh, points made by, I think it was um, uh, Sayal, I think I got you on. Sayal, I'm sorry, and, uh, and Mary, uh, particularly on um, access and collaboration and also on the question of the, of the red lines, where the two key points, perhaps two of you can share that. Um, on, on the humanitarian access, uh, one of the first things that really struck me, and this was probably in, in around 2013, 2014, uh, a lot of my time was spent in the, in the hospitals in, in Turkey uh, meeting uh, victims. And a lot of the stories we were getting were consistent attacks on particular routes that, that they were taking out of Syria um, into, into Turkey. And um, we were fortunate to find, um, I say fortunate, only fortunate in the sense we were able to document precisely what was happening, why it was happening. We were able to uh, obtain documents from the regime, from the various different intelligence branches that were pinpointing the routes that were being taken. They, of course, characterized this as these are soldiers going back for treatment so they can then go back into the field. But that was one of the startling revelations for us to actually see documents being seized by the intelligence branches that they, they had identified these various different routes. And that's where it makes it very, very difficult to then get people safely out when it's not just the hospitals that are being targeted inside Syria and the medical professionals, but it's actually the, the routes that are being taken to get these people safely out of the country. It's very difficult to provide an answer on, on how you can actually do that safely. The, the other point about coordinating the work with different groups, one of the biggest frustrations that I've had in dealing with, with this work over the last few years is actually getting organizations, NGOs, to, to talk to each other and cooperate. Um, I mean, I can tell you just Two weeks ago, I sat in a very frustrating meeting with a number of different NGOs that are working on documentation accountability. And there are cases being brought in three or four different countries using the same victims, same accounts, they're being interviewed repeatedly, and none of these organizations are actually cooperating. And I think that's the same with a number of other organizations um, that, are, that are focusing more on healthcare, that there is not that level of open cooperation. I don't know whether it's a question of empire building, whether it's protecting their funding for what they're doing, um, but it's, it's, it's very difficult to start criticizing the Syrians for not working with the international community when the internationals won't even work together. And I think that is one, one of the very serious problems that we see in Syria that we haven't seen elsewhere. That there has been groups working together. It may well be much more coordinated on, on the medical front, but certainly on the legal front, it really is not coordinated at all. And that's putting an additional barrier into getting things done. The one thing I would say, uh, as I'm a lawyer, I'll focus on, on the legal side, is Having been a prosecutor and a defense counsel in war crimes cases, it is very, very easy to discredit cases and discredit accounts 
when a particular victim has given four or five separate statements. No statement, however true it might be, will ever be the same more than once. And that's where you have a real problem in documenting, is that you've got to have consistency and you've got to have cooperation. And I think that's across the board with NGOs, international organizations, whether it's through different UN, UN branches and the groups on the ground that are providing humanitarian support. They can't do that unless, unless they cooperate, and they're not doing it. Thank you very much. Uh, um, on the red lines, you ask a, a really good question. When you have a red line, whether it's stipulated like Obama did over chemical weapons, or whether it's inferred or, or directed as in protecting hospitals, you know, it, unless you protect that red line, it really means nothing. And um, and I think they're, they're in the issue. If the protagonists don't think you're going to do anything about these red lines, red lines then you get an issue. Um, I, I was a young tank commander in the first Gulf War and then went up on something called Op Haven, which is northern Iraq, where we had a no-fly zone. And the, Kur and the Kurds and the Peshmerga, who I got to know very well recently, uh, were protected. Uh, Saddam Hussein had a campaign called the Anfal campaign, where in effect he was trying to exterminate the Kurdish race and actually killed about 400,000. The no-fly zone became a red, red line in the international coalition policed it with aircraft and were prepared to shoot down anything that went into it. Therefore, it was very effective. Uh, what we've seen in Syria, uh, red lines around hospitals have been ignored, and pretty much red lines on the use of chemical weapons have been ignored. Um, bizarrely, I will sort of uh, mention Mr. Trump here, who after the nerve agent attack on a place called Khan Shakun on, in April 2015, uh, then uh, destroyed those aircraft uh, with um, um, cruise missiles, that had done it. Um, now, whatever you think of Trump, to me he's done one good thing in his term. That, we haven't seen a nerve agent attack in Syria since then. Uh, sadly, we've seen a lot of chlorine being used. I, I had a rather straightforward conversation with the minister this week who so suggests to me that actually chlorine wasn't a chemical weapon. Um, and there in the issue, I, I did point out that it was the first chemical weapon ever used, and any toxic chemical used to injure or kill people is viewed as a chemical, un chemical weapon under the Chemical Weapons Convention. When we come back to the medical side, again, I did sort of, you know, I am a bit of a, an interventionist when it is required, and when it comes to protecting hospitals in Syria, which my point is it's a crime against humanity. Well, we track, we have the ability to track every aircraft flying in the skies over Syria. And something that we have discussed in the all-party group in Syria many times is, is tracking of these aircraft that are attacking hospitals and also the helicopters drop, dropping barrel bombs and chlorine barrel bombs. And at one extreme, you can shoot them down quite easily. On the other extreme, it's a question of, of, of the reality or the, the more likelihood for success. It's very much naming and shaming. And when it comes to red lines for hospitals in Syria, what, what I would like to see the international community, us, the UK, the US doing, is the next time a hospital is destroyed, like M10 or, or hospitals in Ghouta, is for the government to name that aircraft and those people who did it. And that, to me, is a way to start it moving. But my point being, it's all very well having red lines, but unless you're prepared to protect them, they are purely a, a mark on a map. Well, thank you very much. I, I thoroughly endorse that from my own experience at the UN, but I just hope to bear, ask you to bear in mind that uh, one of the hesitancies as we focus on Syria today is that if you were to have that vis-a-vis -vis Syria, which I would thoroughly support, uh, tomorrow you'd also have to have the same naming and shaming of an aircraft which had done the same thing in Yemen. Uh, and this is where you get the balance of diplomacy and politics coming in to, to interfere with what we know to be the necessary consistency or principle above politics, above uh, the approach that's taken by contested uh, positions. Uh, and the difficulty very often of this interaction in today's world, in particular in urban conflict, uh, very often not the old campaigning state versus state warfare, uh, where you've got a state can often be protected by its other institutional state mechanisms, the UN, through a resolution, and therefore called legitimate 
versus non-legitimate, and of course the only people who suffer in between are the civilians who get caught up in the conflict, uh, which one side wants to justify. So these are extraordinarily complex issues when they surface up to the way institutions work as against what's happening on the ground. And I think that's what we need to use events like this today, and I'm going to now come on to the next uh, series of three questions which I think we're in the audience. But it's that, it's the reason why it's so important for us to be here in Cambridge with great minds thinking these things through, because the reality on the ground is painful to see, it motivates us. But the solutions are going to be very, very intellectually hard won because we find a way of getting to that consistency of absolute values that can then be applied universally, which is what Toby's been emphasizing. Can I just add um, of course. on that? I think it's really important that you have your top line mission statement, which is the absolute sanctity and uh, uh, keeping healthcare and conflict sacred. And everything else has got to fall down from that. So it doesn't matter if it's Yemen, it doesn't matter if it's Syria, it doesn't matter who the pilot is, what uniform he wears, the same rules apply. Something has got to happen at that level. Uh, uh, you've just got to have, at the start, the sanctity of healthcare and conflict, and everything else must follow from that. I, I, I personally agree with that, and of course, in many ways, that is already in place in the law. Uh, and the OICRC is the prime um, uh, custodian of it. The difficulty comes when the interests of various bodies that are represented come into conflict with that, and getting to that level of universality, lack of compromise, is, uh, is of course the nature of of the political dimension. Now, I appreciate that we're straying into what to then become the networking, uh, to use the modern thing, uh, opportunity, but I think there's still a hunger to have, a, did I see about three more hands? Can I just see who else has got a question they'd like to raise? There's one down here, uh, there's one there, and there's one there. So let's take these three, and then as we do the answers, I'll give each member of the panel also a chance just as we give their, their top line that they want to make sure that we all leave with. and. Uh, who knows, may even reach a communique. Uh, so again, uh, let's start with you at the front row and then... Uh, um, Thank you. Um, my name is William East, I'm a barrister, well, albeit in a very different field to, to Toby. Um, I've just got a question about the U UN Security Council because there was some mention of that and the seeming impotence of it in the light of Russia being able to veto things. It's obviously been quite a similar position with regard to the council for many years since the Second World War and there are countries such as our own country who have interest in it maybe not changing because we've got a veto at the moment, whereas we might not if the Security Council was being um, constructed all over again. Um, and clearly also the US, I, I can't imagine they would be that happy with the idea of the vetoes being done away with. So it's really a rather pessimistic question in a way is there really any potential for change in the future in relation to the Security Council? And if so, how could that come about? Thank you. I, I'm going to park it. I suspect I need to address that uh, in closing remarks. Uh, so we have we had uh, one here, one here, one here. So actually, we, we now we have four. I, had, I must have missed you earlier on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Hamza Sendit, and I'm an undergraduate law student here at uh, Cambridge. My question kind of relates to the humanitarian intervention point. Um, I suppose, how would you suggest a balance be struck between ensuring that any use of force to enforce these, these norms and red lines is on the one hand effective, but on the other hand uh, avoids issues of kind of mission creep and also make sure that the intervention itself holds itself to the highest possible standards such that it doesn't worsen the situation. Good. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a very important and very difficult question. And then I think finally, um, the lady here in front. Hi, I'm um, Susan Alden from uh, DFID. I'm a health advisor on Syria. Um, Tommy, you spoke really eloquently about the accountability piece, and one of the, the questions I've been wondering about is how confident we are in the evidence and the facts, and particularly where we're seeing that being undermined, particularly on social media and online, um, and whether or not that's a threat, or is, if that's just more noise in the system. Um, and I'm going to cheekily ask a second question. Um, 
I, I think you, well, we're putting a lot of our hopes on UN Security Council 2286, and so I think um, Stephen will, will address the, the needs on that. But I guess there's something as, while we look at this issue globally and while we think about Aleppo, I mean, what we have is 1,100 health workers trapped in Eastern Ghouta right now. Um, we're helping with fortification, we're helping with chemical weapons training, we're helping with everything we can, but I think we feel a real element of, of desperation for those individuals, and I guess your thoughts on what more we can do while two years on we still have Security Council, to, you know, we, we, we have these moments, but we still wring our hands, and so what can we do for those people on the ground? Thanks. Great, well, some uh, really outstanding questions, and thank you all very much indeed. So I think uh, what I'll do is I'm going to run along. Um, I think the easiest thing possible is to start with Toby, and, and we'll go down the table this way. So Toby. Um, there were not Maybe you should uh, tackle those which are relevant to you, and anything else you want to add. So the, the risk of letting me go first is that I get the opportunity to answer as many questions as I like. But I'll, I'll just focus on, on two points. Um, the, the point on the UN Security Council, uh, I think, is, is an important point to make. Removing the, the, the veto power, generally, I think, is extremely unlikely. Um, and of course, it's not just Russia. Um, when when the, the motion was put forward for the referral, the US also raised their objections that they would veto it um, if there was any consideration that it would cover the Golan Heights. So, and of course, the US has consistently vetoed anything that relates to, to Palestine. Um, and of course, we've vetoed uh, a number of resolutions ourselves as well. So, one of the points which is being argued now is whether the, the power of veto could be removed solely in respect of referral to the International Criminal Court. And I think that that is potentially something that could be argued. I'm still highly skeptical as to whether it would pass. Um, because there is, there is still going to be the interest of states in not allowing that to go forward. Um, but I think it's, it, it has a stronger basis to make if you're only referring to atrocity crimes and accountability, namely in the International Criminal Court or the creation of an ad hoc tribunal. So I think that that's something that could be considered. And I look forward to our chair addressing that at the end of the discussion. In terms of the evidence and the strength of the evidence, um, I'll quote uh, a, a very experienced war crimes prosecutor who um, I'm very fortunate to work with very closely, Stephen Rapp, who's been involved with a number of different conflicts. When we were dealing with the, C the analysis of the Caesar material, um, he actually said that it was the legal equivalent of a slam dunk. The evidence is so overwhelming. The the quality of the photographic material that we have with the metadata is very powerful. It has been analyzed by a number of different groups, Human Rights Watch, the FBI, with, with their special counterterrorism unit and their, their, their document and image uh, analysis unit. It has been uh, verified by doctors, experts with Physicians for Human Rights. That evidence is, is, is compelling. You also have the situation, as far as the crimes committed by the Syrian regime are concerned, um, not so much with crimes by Islamic State and, and other armed groups, but certainly as far as the regime is concerned, they document everything. That they are so bureaucratic in what they do. Um, it's almost uh, like a, a Soviet form of bureaucracy that they run. So for example, when you look at Caesar and what his job was, he, he was a crime scene photographer. That was his job. Which changed from photographing um, car crashes to photographing victims in a mortuary. Every single individual was assigned three numbers. Their prison number, their facility number, and their death number. That then went to a pathologist who issued a report as to the cause of death that then went in front of a judge who stamped and signed. And we have hundreds of those documents. We also have <coughs> orders that are filtered through 
from the highest level of the various different intelligence branches that go right up to the presidency. That there is hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of documents. I mentioned earlier about the document that gave coordinates for targeting those that were taking uh, injured civilians. There are thousands of documents of that kind. There are also documents that are referring to different branches of the armed forces as opposed to the intelligence branches, telling the army this is not your job, this is for a particular intelligence branch. So giving them very clear directions on when they are arrested, they are handed over to particular military uh, security and intelligence branches. So when you look at the kind of cases that we were dealing with in, in Bosnia, in Rwanda, at the international tribunals, much of the evidence relied upon witness accounts. We do, of course, have hundreds and hundreds of witnesses that have come forward to verify, but most of these cases are built on documentation and they're built upon the record keeping of the regime itself. Thank you, Terry, very much indeed. Uh, Hamish. Um, humanitarian intervention is, is a tricky subject, but if we look at Syria, half a million dead, although it's probably more likely a million, 11 million um, IDPs, and 5 million refugees. 75% um, of children in rebel held areas have post-traumatic stress disorder, and over 50% of children in Syria have not lost their education. That's what non-intervention looks like. Um, if we look at the so-called Islamic State, uh, where the coalition did come together to intervene, and I was in Tikrit with the Iraqi bomb disposal teams in 2015, disposing chlorine improvised explosive devices and hearing exactly what so-called Islamic State were up to. You know, I won't go into the details, but you know, unbelievably horrific. And again, over the last three years of the Peshmerga in Mosul and other places, again, seeing the, the so-called Islamic State at first hand. Intervention there has destroyed the so-called Islamic State, we will still have issues with them at time immemorial. But uh, that was uh, seen to be the right way of doing it. When we didn't intervene in Syria in 21st of August 2013, um, after the big chemical attack there, uh, we then saw the Russians get involved. So I think the thing with intervention, um, everybody thinks intervention looks like Iraq 2003. Um, I was there then, um, I was also in Afghanistan, and I was in Syria, and they're all very, very different. Um, but I think with uh, technology these days and the precision that can be done, the argument for humanitarian intervention is, must be taken um, with great consideration and by people, particularly our politicians, who some you know, are not as brave as Stephen and some of his colleagues that, that I know well, and, and sometimes it's difficult decisions, but just look at what non-intervention has happened in Syria, and the fact that most of the children in Syria are suffering terribly and without education, that country is gonna take decades to recover. So sometimes there really is a need for intervention, but I accept it's a really difficult one to answer. Well, thank you, I'll come back to that, but I mean, uh, you, have to, you have to remember that Humanitarian intervention costs a lot of money, therefore it tends to come from those of the rather richer Western democratic systems. And I can certainly speak from some experience, humanitarian intervention, despite what it sounds like, is not actually easy in democracies, it tends not to win you votes. And so there's, a, there's another problem there in terms of motivation. Uh, so um, interestingly enough, when um, uh, Boat was about to happen in 2013. I was in Atarib with Hand in Hand. Um, I was working, and this also sort of feeds back into James's initial question about what can hospitals do to protect. So, um, smaller clinics. I was working in a smaller clinic in a hospital in Atarib. Um, uh, these facilities are not equipped to deal with the mass casualty situations that, um, uh, that, that we are seeing in Syria. Um, that evening, um, we witnessed it, we were filming, we had a film crew with us, we had made a film called uh, Saving Serious Children for Panorama, 
it, uh, there was an, it was such a horrific attack. We, we read reports about bombs um, on, on, on schools, uh, on hospitals. When you're actually there looking after the aftermath, it's another matter. And the film crew that we had with us were very, very experienced BBC journalists couldn't believe what they were witnessing and they really felt that what they'd witnessed was going to make uh, a contribution to ending this war because people would be horrified when they saw it. Unfortunately, the film footage went out after the vote. We sat there, I was still in my clothes from looking after 28 severely burned children uh, covered in, in the debris and still smelling of the smoke. And I was sitting there and I was hoping it was going to be a yes for intervention because I had seen what it looked like when there was nothing there to protect them. And I'd also asked the Syrians who were with me that day, what do you want? What, you know, they, they, were, they were so thrilled that this was actually being taken seriously and being voted on and debated in Westminster, in London, miles and miles away. And the heartbreak when the vote to step away it was palpable. It was really painful to look them in the eyes when they saw the results of that day. But very, very, very quickly, what I do think as a solution, number one, I think medics are a particular bunch. I joined them later in life. Um, and they are, uh, you know, a bunch of people that want to sort of, you know, work for the sake of their patients. I think we need to find a way, and, and this war is killing our patients and our colleagues and destroying our facilities and rendering it unsafe for us to work. So I think an alliance of medics around the world globally, I know we have the World Health Organization, I haven't really, I, I haven't really heard them say that much on this. I think we need to you know, collect ourselves, group together and really you know, shout with one voice to say you know, enough is enough. Thank you very much, Lisa. David. Um, to answer your questions, what are we doing? Um, well, it was a little bit easier in 2016 in Aleppo because I knew all the doctors there. Um, it was much easier. I was getting information via WhatsApp. We were discussing cases. And it was a matter of really, because I knew them, it was easier to bang the drum so, so hard. And, and we did. And in fact, uh, I went to see Andrew Mitchell in his home, the MP. He was the one who caused uh, two... Um, emergency parliamentary debates which she had and we just banged the drum and banged the drum and it was a matter of making everybody understand how terrible the situation was and, and not only that um, I think provide some advocacy to try if we possibly could change the situation. E-Scooter is different at the moment because I don't know the doctors there. I've, I, I've, we've set up a WhatsApp group so that we can, um, they can, and they can come things on my phone all the time about what would you do about this case, what would you do about that case. It's a matter of um, showing solidarity with them. It's a matter of saying, we're here to try and help you. And, and we're here, you know, we may be 6,000 miles away, but you have our huge support. And purely on a humanitarian front, on a, on a medical front, it's easy because we all just dealing with the patients. That's all we, we need to do. Uh, Hamish and I uh, this week have, um, uh, and over the last, couple of weeks have been trying our best and, uh, because there are some routes that we can get through uh, to some people to try and see if we can finally get some message to President Assad to tell him that the world is looking at him and from international um, from, from, from international uh, ways that to try and make him understand that you know if you don't change your views you're going to be looked on as a despot for the rest of your life. And now is the time to change. And it's in, in, interesting that there are people um, around him who do realize that you, know, you can't be a murderer for the most of your life. And um, we're working on that. That's what Doctors Under Fire are trying to do. Thanks. Very, very briefly, because we're so out of time. Um, and it's just to return to the question you asked, um, one of the important things is how you get the evidence out and how you make it strong. Now, of course, there are going to be challenges to the credibility of that process. Um, and I think this is a particular point for, for, for the UK government to think about and other donors to think about. 
individuals need to be trained on how to do that properly. They don't need to be trained on the niceties of international humanitarian law. Um, and a lot of money has been put into that, and it has no effect. What they need to be trained on is when they're photographing an attack, how you document that, how, how do you establish a chain of custody, and how do you make it credible. That's the kind of focus training that these individuals are crying out for. Um, we've done some work on that, but obviously it's, it's a very difficult, long process. And as I mentioned, with the doctors, how they document their cases and how, how they make them strong. That's what needs to be focused on, because the cases will fall on the credibility of the process. Interestingly, having been a DFID minister, I would just, given you are representing DFID um, and yourself, I would just add that all this costs money as well as anything else. And I think it is to a credit of DFID, uh, and certainly as a minister, it was an extremely tough challenge that, um, that notwithstanding that I uh, share as one of the authors of the 0.7% law, and I'm very proud of that, and we need to defend that day in, day out from those who would seek to undermine it. It's very important because to have 0.7% of your gross national income spent on overseas development assistance as defined, it needs to include a sufficient range of activities that includes using military to train other militaries who are part of recovering in a security situation, the freedom. So it's good that British soldiers are training Nigerian or Nigerian soldiers in the Sahel to recover ground which has been taken by the Boko Haram terrorists as they reveal the atrocities that have been meted out, particularly upon women and girls. But they know, therefore, the human rights element of being a combat recovery soldier. And therefore, to be able to use ODA for that kind of purpose, to my mind, is wholly justified, because it's part of humanitarian and developmental relief, as well as capability, um, and not, and can't be accused of being state capacity building, because it's about individual judgment skills and its expertise that's required to sustain what is always going to be necessary in the aftermath if we're going to have anything to hold people to account, which is where we fall down so abysmally. And so I do think that the, the question about uh, DFID pushing harder and harder, the expansion of the definition of owner is a really worthwhile and important thing, because I would want that to happen rather than people think 0.7% needs to be given up because it isn't sufficiently wide enough to cope with these training issues, which, uh, whether it's uh, army, police, lawyers, uh, in order to have that capacity and to have that future accountability. So just on that one issue, that was uh, something I just wanted to mention, because that comes out of real decision-making, ministerial decision-making, as well as policy development and funding. Um, I was going to seek very briefly, if I may, to try and tackle what was obviously put very simply, but we all know is one of the most testing questions for our generation. Um, given that we've had 72 years of the United Nations, so it has not failed, like the League of Nations, there is a perception that it has been relatively successful insofar as the globe has not been met by a third world war. It has certainly been met by global warming, and goodness knows it's taken us a long time under climate change to get the UN mechanisms to find that as one of the great potential attackers of mankind and the humanitarian uh, issues that we've all had to face as a result of that. But in terms of conflict prevention, let alone resolution, uh, it's been found wanting, but as we've moved from the state to state uh, warfare, in broadest terms, although it's by no means over, more to an insurrectionist, uh, often groups fighting and vying for power, contestation of power, uh, illegitimacy of power, it's become, it's become very difficult for these institutional mechanisms to find how to grip onto anything that can control behaviours, decision making, or a real determination to win, which is part of, one may argue, the political and human condition. And particularly as we've had massive population growth across the uh, world, we've also got now massive resource contestation and competition. And in my view, it's going to be within, and you can see from the colour of my hair, I'm part of the older generation, it's going to be within my lifetime that we end up with massive disputes about access to potable water, uh, which is going to be of major humanitarian concern, let alone to those who are in need of doctor's help at the time in just sustaining human life in the communities that they are. So when the question comes about the security guards, you may wonder why I say all that. Where is the motivation for those who currently have the veto power, those who are currently called the P5, those who currently enjoy contesting to be one of the P10 on the circular wheel that comes and gives them a chance every 10, uh, two years, but according to regions of the world. So there's certain equity which has been parceled out. 
where the deals have been done so that Brazil always furious that he didn't get a member a seat of, as a permanent five uh, to be a permanent six membership. It's therefore given the first chance to speak at every annual meeting of UNGA. I mean, frankly, bully for them, but it, it's what happens. They get the first, and it's every 50 minutes, it always takes hours. So, in a sense, that's the diplomacy of it. And you can see how these things get terribly stuck in the tracks as to where people's interests lie. I personally, having been there and worked with it and had to deal with trying to create impact, because whether you're a humanitarian, and to be honest with you, the, the work that is represented along this panel, and many of you, and we all know there's so many outside, uh, is eye-wateringly uh, amazing and brilliant and hugely admired, and the people who do it are the last who would ever wish to be praised, or indeed uh, think they were holier than thou. On the contrary, it's because there's something that does bind humanitarians, and I would argue many politicians who are concerned about these issues, certainly lawyers and those, uh, very often uh, in the armed forces. It's often counter-perceptive, but I think a lot of people are motivated to make a difference, make a difference for their fellow human beings, and in our totally connected information generating world, where we know within minutes, seconds, where a disaster has happened. And we were all designed as the emergency responders to know how to respond in an international, at scale level, uh, to be able to uh, respond to a natural disaster, an earthquake, seismic, whatever it may be, a tsunami. And frankly, when it happens, as recently in the Caribbean and so forth, of course it's terrible. And we all wish it hadn't happened. And we all think, however fast we are, we're not there soon enough. We don't do enough, quickly enough. But actually, relatively, we're pretty good at it. We're not bad at those responses. It's because of conflict, where you can't get access, because somebody's legitimizing their side of the fight, because you can't get some to fund because they're partial or because they think it's a, a hiding to nothing. And because it is terrible when you look at even the migration issue or the, the display, forced displacement issue of the 250 million people who are moving legitimately around the world every year. 65 million are forcibly displaced. 20 million cross a border. They are the refugees, of course, quite rightly, we have refugee law and all the things that protect them, and we focus a lot rightly on asylum seekers, and it currently represents one of the greatest challenges. I would say not a, not a positive thing, uh, but one of the greatest challenges to the values that we have as a generation uh, about what we do uh, in the broader, rich West to be able to accept and accommodate more of the people who need the, uh, the safe places to come to and to be able to rebuild their lives. But that's 20 million out of 65. 45 million are in total space, many of them in Syria today. Um, and you move just like they have to. If either you can't get your child into school for the third year, or you're about to have a bomb drop in your head. Or, worse still, you become a target because you've got a Red Cross or a Red Cross somewhere near you, or you're on the ambulance route, or you're somebody who seems to be a nurse who gets out to help deliver a baby, where now giving birth is one of the most dangerous life-threatening things that can happen to a woman in Syria, just as sadly it still is in some of the main great maternal um, uh, death uh, statistics of, of still some parts of the 54 countries of the African continent. So, um, what's going to change it? Where's the interest? It's difficult to see. So in many ways, my argument, and the experience I've had in trying to deal with it, is much as it may be desirable, much as we may think there's an equity, much as we may think after 72 years, of a pretty uh, big set of documentary tombstones, we could spend a lot of time getting nowhere on this issue because I can't see what, what you can unlock as a motivation. And when you talk to someone like Brazil, they say, well, actually, we're not that interested in the UN mechanism anymore. We will give support to people in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a South-South soft power dynamic these days. And I would suggest that we need to think very carefully about whether the trusteeship council is one which currently meets once a year, it was the Decolonialization Council. Whether there, there could be an argument, maybe it's the intellectual force of argument that could come from Cambridge, that there is a, at a point where states act in such a terrible way that there is a standard, a red line, over which they forsake their chance to be able to rely upon the state mechanisms of institutional protection, which is why we have such difficulty in dealing with internally displaced people, because it seems to be an interference in the internal affairs of another sovereign state behind their borders. And therefore, we aren't very good at responding to IDPs. 
whereas we do quite a good job on refugees, albeit we're always uh, very concerned to do it. So my, my suggestion would be to, uh, rather than go head, headstrong into this, uh, trying to somehow break the, the P5 apart, uh, it might be more sensible to look at whether we can arbitrate the issue and push it down uh, a way that there's a behavior so terrible that there is a time when the, the, the UN or somebody becomes effectively a trust for that nation whilst it gets its uh, values back together. This is very controversial stuff. It's very difficult. It's as uh, challenging probably as any other mechanism, but at least it's a wise that tends to surround these issues that where, what can we do about it? You've heard the brilliant work and the issue that's in the room tonight is, so what can we do about it to stop this being so dreadful and, and so difficult? And uh, above all, for international humanitarian law, which is not dependent on the UN, it's one in which we pray and aid, can we really have effect? Where uh, another point that I would make in my experience is, and I think this picks up on Slayer's point, which you made a very passionate cry for help, really. We need to do something. I think you're onto something when you, when you think about health. Health may be the point of entry. It's so incontestable that it is unarguable that you should be always focused upon giving people the chance to live. That uh, whether you're fighting, as I've done for decades, about trying to get rid of uh, avoidable, treatable tropical disease like malaria, you know, the, the, the power in the parliament, in an all-party group, is because nobody will dare say, quite rightly, that you should forsake people's lives. You, you know, if you have an argument to save life, it's powerful and it's difficult to find people to come against you. So I think that's where we need to think about where a nation is uh, behaving so badly it forsakes its right. There is a trusteeship for a period until we can start getting mechanisms back which are accountable to the people they serve. And that may be one of the ways and that would avoid us getting into the, I'm afraid, sterile debate about vetoes, P5 membership uh, and how the Security Council works which at the moment is to reduce our ambition to the lowest level of uh, agreement for those common denominator, which of course we all know when you get a resolution, back to your point, uh, the resolution sits there, it's one of the things to have achieved it, amazing diplomatic coup, if you like, uh, but in the end we can see even with the resolutions and the cross-border, which were amazing innovations, but even with the most recent one um, about Eastern Ghouta, and it was exactly the same when I, in October 16, I made my speech to the Security Council about Eastern Aleppo, which is the one you may possibly recall, now it's not about the humanitarian access, it's about being interpreted as a creative corridor to ensure the egress of those who have been effectively flushed out so effectively you get victory by another means. That is what's so dispiriting. And so we've got to find ways, I think, to, 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 to maneuver around rather than take head on, because I think head on we will fail. So I'm sorry I've abused my position as chair. Adam is probably having complete kittens up there about the timetable. Uh, but as chair, I, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so um, I'm deeply grateful, I really am deeply grateful to all the uh, panelists, to uh, Toby Cavan, to Hamish Brett and Gordon, to Salir, and, and to Fadi, who of course came from uh, hand in hand as the co-founder of that, uh, so, so sharply representing uh, the people of Syria, and of course, not least, the inspirational and brilliant work of Dr. David Dont, to, to Adam and those at the department for uh, very much making sure that this happened, uh, being live-streamed, it means it's a bit like being a politician and Hansard is recorded uh, every word, so you can take nothing back that you've said or thought, and, uh, and above all, uh, to each and every one of you, because by being here, you're demonstrating that only by working together and with a real sense of ambition, and common purpose will we be able to reach up to really make that difference, which we all know is the uh, common ambition that we have. So thank you all very much indeed, and in the name of the people of Syria, let's hope uh, and very much practically uh, pray to uh, ensure that uh, their terrible suffering is soon to come to an end in a way that uh, preserves life. Thank you.